There is no truth until you decide what truth is. And each person should find that truth out for his or herself. Okay. All right. I want to thank you again and welcome you to the Meta Center on this particular Saturday. Uh, Saturdays nowadays are becoming quite full. And we're going to start our first look at what are called life streams. We're going to cover at least three of them. There are seven to cover, but I think we can combine them by getting all into three. And the first one that we want to undertake to look at is called the ray called life. The different rays they have been taught sometimes the seven rays of consciousness. And they run, of course, from the infrared all the way to the ultraviolet and everything in between. Now that we're entering what is called the age of Aquarius, it's the time then for people who are expanders of consciousness, for people who want to know, for people who are more leaders than followers, thinkers rather than just uh, regulators and so to come into being. As we talked about before, the age of Pisces is now past, so for the followers, the faithful. These now are the times when you want to expand your mind and expand your consciousness. And it's very interesting that having studied both theosophy and theology to a degree, that we're told again under the theological teachings that in the beginning of creation that there was a word and the word was with God. And under the theosophical belief, it's that in the beginning there was an aleph point or creative fire, and that from that the resonant energy shone through and light was there. But as is the consciousness here, before the word was spoken and before let there be light became, the life thought had to exist somewhere. And that's where we want to start our journey into understanding what is called creative function and understanding one of the first rays of higher consciousness, which is light. Broad spectrum light is what we usually are told is a compilation of other forms of light itself. Broad spectrum light usually exists in a number of fashions. It exists in red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet, and ultraviolet. This is what is called the ultraviolet light spectrum. But yet ultraviolet light is at one end of the scale and red light is at the other end. And the lowest form of red light is what is called infrared rays. What is very interesting is that when we take a look at our society now and our society having passed, something becomes very clear. And from the discussion, of course, many of you had uh, prior to the beginning of today's lecture, nature herself, if you would, as omnipotent wisdom and makes complex things very simple. Man has a little bit of knowledge and makes simple things very complex and can get confused. In studying nature, nature doesn't have time to lie because nature is too busy doing so many other things, the ego is lost. Ego misrepresents many things. And unfortunately, our science has been limited by the ego of the people who are the scientists, those meaning scion to know, versus those who were the students that thought that they were learning from a knowing person. We're finding that our knowledge was very limited. You take a man in a very palatial estate, a mansion, a castle, if you would, or you take a seed in the ground, they both have two things in common. They need food and they need water. But a man in a palatial palace, again, can live a long time without food, not so long without water. But like a plant without food and water, both of them have to have air or they die. In the form of a plant, it's called atmosphere. In the form of a person, it's the same thing, atmosphere. If the rooms in that palatial palace uh, were shut out of air, the person would die immediately. They'll either have to break a window, get out, or get into what they call an overall atmosphere. What we find when we look at the word atmosphere is simply a circle of atoms and elements and energy and light that surrounds our planet. That means that in air is more than just light, is more than just particles. And in the atmosphere, what we call light or air or self again, means composed of something. And whatever that composition is, it's most necessary to keep us alive and keep us functioning. They have stated again that every element 
has a corresponding color that vibrates in the frequency of that element, which means that that is true, that if you understand the color of that element, you can begin to understand the kind of energy that may be in that element. In our science now, they teach that there are three basic components or elements, and that is hydrogen, oxygen, and carbon. Hydrogen, oxygen, and carbon. Hydrogen gives off a red energy field. Oxygen gives off a blue energy field. And carbon gives off what is called a yellow energy field. When we study that further, we find that seeing the color red in any type of a situation, it stimulates the physical body through the eyes. Seeing the color yellow, it makes one kind of grow refreshed and awakened. And seeing the color blue, it's kind of soothing, it's very calmative, it's a sedative type of a color, if you would. If you had a burn or you had an inflammation, you would use blue or oxygen on that burn, and the burn would begin to heal. If you had a fever, you would drink water. It only has oxygen in water, which is also blue. If you were um, very weak uh, in a comatose state, you'd use red, and that would begin to give energy and strength back to the body itself. So you can begin to see just in our first look that elements are very interesting things, but colors are very interesting things too. Because of this, we get into some of the advanced sciences and we understand what is called molecular biology. Now, man's molecular biology, which is very close to what we call almost quantum physics, the first basics of it again, says that light is the smallest particle. Now, if light is the four smallest particle, then that would mean that a particle has no mass because light has no mass. That's why they begin to generate what they call quantum theory or plasma physics. Light has no mass, yet they call it a particle. Light exists only in the mind as the brain perceives it. I'll repeat that again. Light has no mass. Therefore, you can't hold it. You can't feel it when it's a particle, but you can perceive it through the mind, which means it is something that is subatomic, almost into a plasma or quantitative type of a thing. Now, if you take two particles of light and you combine them, you have what is called an electron. An electron has mass and it has weight. But keep in mind, it is still composed of what? Two particles of light, which had no mass and could only be visualized by the mind itself. What that simply says is, is that there is an energy field by which things are generated into mass, but that energy field is pure mind. It is pure energy. Light is one of the first basis of that conversion of mind into energy, into a particle, which means that the sub thing or the thing behind everything is simply pure mind whatever mind is. And we say that because most of you feel you have one because when you lose it, you say people are what? So you are also capable of doing the same thing as whatever is creating the light particle because you've been given what is called mind. The only way you see the manifestation of mind is to use your brain, which is your organ of transmutation or the vessel, the clothing that mind can operate in that makes it become visible. Otherwise, it's invisible. So you're given a brain to use mind in body. Are you with me so far? Trying to go slow enough, then we get to this way out quantum here. Some form of energy is necessary to sustain everything that you can see or believes it did. Some form of energy is behind it. All bacteria and all germs, therefore, have some kind of energy that they're operating in and on. Sometimes they operate in and on you, taking your energy, feeding off of you, and this is what they call parasites. But every type of creature has some type of energy behind it, and it therefore is also radiated 
some type of energy from itself. If you therefore understand the frequency or the wavelength of the energy that this thing operates on, you can control it. You can expand it. You can shrink it. You can explode it. You can make it coagulate. You can make it do whatever you want you do by light wave modulation. Adjusting the frequency of something by understanding the vibrational field it generates, which means that it's possible to understand all forms of bacteria, all forms of germs, and even the so-called manifested now viruses, which is we will show soon that the combination of bacteria, germs, and chemical to create a new type of a animated substance. It's neither a germ, it's neither a bacteria, it's neither a chemical. It is now a combination that is mutated. Give it, for instance, on that same kind of a thought, and let's just take fluorescent light. How many of you either have work, do work, or around fluorescent lights, or see fluorescent lights in the stores, or any offices? Everybody knows what I mean when I say fluorescent light. You see the big fluorescent light tubes. What happens if you break that fluorescent light tube? Explodes. Why does it explode? It explodes because you have gases within there, under compression, being titillated by a little electronic spark there again, one of which is mercury. And this is what these agitated particles give. They give light. Fluorescent lights are one problem that we have that is not even talked about. We've talked about it in here simply because we've talked about the need for diodes to control fluorescent light. Fluorescent light has in there mercury, which forms a vapor, which agitates the other particles because mercury, once put in motion, tends to stay in motion. So it's always agitating these particles. And as they combine with each other, through an energy field, they give off light. But those tubes are very compressed. Now, they radiate sometimes a very harmful type of energy, which is called radiation. Radiation simply means that the pattern or wave does not have one set motion, but it comes long, it comes short, it comes quick, it comes slow. Your body can't adjust to it. Therefore, the radiation penetrates through the skin organ, which is supposed to be your protective barrier, and begins to hurt your inside organs and gland. That's what radiation is, a non-variable form of molecular wave motion. Simply put, if you can't adjust to it, it can harm you. Either it goes past you, if you're lucky, or it enters into you, and until you know how to get it out, it just begins to destroy from within. That's what microwaves do, another form of radiant energy, if you will. They have what they call broad-spectrum light, one of which many of you have heard about is called ot light. Broad-spectrum light differs from fluorescent light if because it gives you a full spectrum, at least seven rays of energy generated just like the sun gives, rather than just one man-made kind of energy, which again can be very penetrating. Full spectrum light seems to help people to live better, to get over diseases better, and to heal faster. And we find that in animals because when they get sick or when they're not exposed to uh, that, they go outside into the light, they try to drink water, they breathe air, and they try to heal themselves by fasting, not eating food. He talked about this before. Now we'll break down why that does happen this way. The light and the sun that we have on this planet is our protector or our worst enemy. It depends on the kind of energy that that sun puts out. And it depends on the person receiving that energy, how they can interpret it, how they can begin to adjust to it. Our two glands on most people here on this planet at this particular time, which work with that, are called the pineal gland, and in a male, the orchid gland. In a female, there's an entirely different thing going on. We'll soon be talking about that. When those two glands within us receive broad spectrum light, they act like step up or step down transformers. They convert that light into usable energy within the body 
and the glands that are in the body then receive it as it sends it out. And this is what has been called in many cases melanocyte, because the pineal gland secretes what is called melanin. Melanin is like a great big crystal in your skull. Now, there are many people who are buying lots of crystals and who have crystal layouts and so on like this, and I tell them again, you are the biggest walking crystal ever created. Only you're capable of being mobile. The crystal in your head is called the pineal gland. In a male, the crystal in your lower body is called an orchid gland. And in between, you have radiations stepping up or stepping down. One of the things that the pineal gland generates is what is called frozen light. Frozen light is a crystalline subject called substance called melanin. Melanin gets into the blood, and wherever the blood flows, it forms little crystals of energy which go to each and every cell and each and every gland you have, which is called a melanin site or melanocyte. And there these crystals activate directly from the sun energy. They don't have to wait for the brain to tell them to do so because it's just like a traveling sun going through your body. Wherever it goes, it gives that particular cell, which is part of maybe an organ, or I'm sorry, or gland or tissue, the ability to receive that light in the energy frequency that it needs. This is what the blessing of melanin does. Cut out the pineal gland. Melanin can still reproduce itself, but it begins to go smaller and smaller in the overall use because it can't remanufacture everything. It just remanufactures what your body is able to hold. That's why the now trend toward new synthetic melanin and why melanin now is being talked about so very much. Go back now to the germ theory and bacteria and chemicals and viruses again. In laboratory tests, they make two mistakes. Well, they make a lot of mistakes. But one big mistake is this one. They have what they call testing in vitro, which simply means outside of the body, in a Petri dish, in a laboratory experiment, under controlled conditions, if you would. But what may happen in vitro, testing a substance outside of the body, may definitely not be what happens in what they call in vivo inside you, inside your blood, inside your tissue. Outside in the Petri dish, you can control, or the sciences control, the conditions. Inside, they fail to understand that the blood can change based on melanin, based on an active pineal gland, and based on what kind of energy happens to be coming into the planet or into the body at that particular time. Without understanding that, you can not do the same thing in a laboratory to a person that you can once you enter into that person's body, which is called invasive therapy. Many bacteria, and I'm going to go through this very slow. If you're taking notes, fine. If you're taking mental notes, fine. Many bacteria contain two photosensitive amino acids. That simply means light sensitive little molecules in there, which are called amino acids. One is called phenylalanine. The other is called tyrosine. These two things are light-sensitive amino acids. Out of the whole amino acid spectrum, 22 of them, these two are very light-sensitive. So, somebody, nature if you would, has created these bacteria to first come on, on the scene utilizing phenylalanine and tyrosine. But when ultraviolet light hits these two amino acids or is sent into these amino acids in these bacteria. They can cause the bacteria to, to absorb too much energy, which makes them become more fluid. They coagulate, and they come together and destroy themselves. One of the easiest ways to control bacteria is to ultraviolet light sequences and frequency on what are called those two amino acids. Now, this is very easy to do because as long as the sun shines, or as long as you're exposed to broad spectrum